it's seaweed day. Uh, it's one of the great days in the year. It's not the official UN day. Maybe one day it will be. Uh, and we at the UN Global Compact, together with Lloyd's Register Foundation, is hosting this small session uh, to really talk about seaweed and the potential and the role going forward. We're, we will give everybody a few seconds to log on. We are expecting quite a few people uh, to attend this online session. As you know, we were all supposed to be in Lisbon, uh, in Portugal, for the UN Ocean uh, Conference this week. Uh, we will meet next year at some point when this pandemic uh, is uh, more under control and we can physically meet together again. We know that one of our speakers is actually talking from Lisbon, so we'll hear from him <laughs> later. Looking forward to that. I think it's a sunny day down there. It has been sunny here in Oslo, where we are broadcasting from. Uh, so then I think we are about 230 people online already. So since it's seaweed day, there's only one really way to start. We we'll open this bag of seaweed chips and I'll share it with my good colleague, Chashi. <laughs> I haven't tried this one before, this is new. It's called me. <laughs> Salt and tasty. It's very good actually. My kids love it. And that's a sign that seaweed is a part of the future. And that's really why we are here today. We're gonna test some seaweed while people uh, speak. We're gonna end drinking this seaweed <laughs> kind of thing. And of course, we are gonna launch the Seaweed Manifesto. It's online at seaweedmanifesto.com. You can download it and read it there. And you can support it by go to that website. You will also find that in, in the field next to the uh, video player. <coughs> we will share some links on that. So why do we do this? At the UN Global Compact, we are seeking a principled way based on the 10 principles of the UN Global Compact on environment, on human rights, labor rights, and anti-corruption towards the 17 SDGs, the global goals that we all have to work together to achieve in 2030. Myself, my name is Erik Jaske. I'm heading the Sustainable Ocean Business Action Platform at the UN Global Compact. And I work there together with Kjersti and a few others online here today. And we try to find out the role of oceans in delivering these goals. And we have seen the emergence of seaweed as a core ingredient on many of these tasks going forward. This is food, it's feed, it's fuel, it's medicine, and it's big potential carbon, cap uh, carbon storage and cap uh, capture uh, ingredient. So there are some super interesting potentials. And together we can see if we can really move this industry forward, which is already very big in Asia, but it can be even bigger and even be a larger part of our society and daily lives if we do things right and if we do it together. So today we have prominent speakers from the UN system, from the private sector, from academia, and leading voices in the ocean uh, sphere to share these ambitions about this. This project was first and foremost spearheaded by Lodge Registers Foundation and Vincent uh, Dumisel, who had a, this great idea together with his friends that we need a manifesto, we need a vision, and we need to uh, write it down on a paper and issue it so people can support this, and then we can start this exciting journey going forward. So with that said, it's my big honor to give the floor to my good friend, Vincent, who will say a bit more about why we are here today, and we will enjoy some seaweed while you listen to Vincent, please. Thank you. We can hear you. Thank you very much, Eric, and, uh, and, and thanks uh, for this introduction. And good afternoon, uh, good morning, good evening to everyone here. Uh, first of all, I have to say we are very glad to see so many people gathered today for the launch of the Seaweed Manifesto. And first of all, I would like to thank once again all the contributors and speakers for their support to release that document. We surely did not expect such a commitment when we launched uh, that ID some months ago. And allow me to go back in time a little further. 20,000, 12,000 years ago or so, human beings moved from prehistory to modern history when they stopped being hunters gatherers to develop agriculture and livestock. Our history has been mostly fueled by land production. And today we are still hunter gatherers in the ocean while it covers more than two thirds of our planet. 
Kiwi today represents a market of $6 billion with a production of 30 million tons and 99.5% of this cultivation takes place in Asia. How come only one region in the world has learned to farm a very sustainable and diversified resource that could be used as healthy food, responsible feed, natural fertilizers, and so much more with no need of any land, fresh water, nor chemicals? How come haven't we learned to use resources that need very little investment and are available everywhere in the world and notably to the most vulnerable coastal community. Fish aquaculture is the fastest growing sector in food today. But we tend to reproduce the same mistake as we did on land with little understanding of the positive interaction between marine ecosystems where seaweed is fundamental. In the meantime, we've, we have been successful, successful to feed a very fast growing population. This development has reached some limits today, and we are the first generation to fully appreciate them. We are the first generation to know that global warming is powered mostly by human activity and is a severe threat to life on our planet. Land agriculture accounts for one third of the global emission and keeps growing. We are the first generation to fully acknowledge that our very complex food systems reach maximum capacities on land. There is not much arable land left, yields are stable, a growing part of crops is used for biofuel. Least in the meantime, we have another 300,000 additional people to feed every day on the planet. Modern diets are much more demanding in calories and over 800 million people are going to bed hungry every day. We need a solution now. We are the first generation of educated customers who, through their choices, can shape the world they want. Four times a day, we are all environmental activists. Each time we eat and we drink, we can vote for the world we want. Altogether, we are drivers of the change and we are connected to the same production system. Through our purchasing decisions, we could accelerate adoptions of more responsible or healthier products in every country. We are also the first generation to know that a massive biodiversity loss is taking place on our planet. In the ocean, due to acidification, eutrophication, plastic pollution and ecosystem disruption, this biodiversity extension will be less visible, maybe even faster among land. We are a generation fully realizing today how much we are still very vulnerable. Our long-term health could be at risk if medicine does not explore further all existing potential solutions to mitigate impact from disease. Eventually, we are the first generation understanding that this growing difference between the very small portion of population, very rich population, and those billions of people starving and deprived of any right, is not only a shame for our civilization, but is a time bomb for all of us. Once you acknowledge about this risk, you become accountable for not taking any action. You need to bring new solution, solution to life. And we believe that if necessary research and investment are made, seaweed has the potential to provide sustainable food, feed, fertilizer, substitute to plastic, sequester carbon, to clean and restore the ocean, and to provide a source of revenues in order to alleviate poverty in emerging countries. Looking at recent development on this last point, in Africa and South Asia, where women are mostly in charge of this new production, we could also hope that seaweed would contribute to women empowerment and gender equality. My organization, Lloyd's Register, is active in the ocean since 1760. With 260 years of experience, we may not be the most famous, famous nor the biggest organization here today, but surely the oldest one. Over that 100 years of experience, we have learned some key lessons about long-term resilience. First, we have learned that ocean is absolutely critical to survival and is our most precious asset. We are unsure if we could save the ocean, but we are pretty sure the ocean can save us. Second, we have learned that development over the centuries can only be enabled by the quest for more safety and more social justice. The more resilient businesses model are social businesses. This concern is fully embodied by the LR Foundation, a charity that sits at the top of our, our, of our organization and initiated this civic manifesto. Lastly, we have also learned that cooperation 
and sharing experience is critical to the development of any global solution. And that there is nothing more global than ocean. There are no frontiers in the ocean. Nothing that can prevent algae, virus, fishes or pollution to move from a territory to another. We need a public and private partnership and cross-country collaboration to enable a proper management of the ocean. All together, and that can only be all together, we could be remembered as the first generation to really leverage on the potential of marine plants to provide long-term safety, sustainable food, and health solutions to everyone on this planet. We could be remembered as such. But I do hope it, I do believe we will be. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vincent. Uh, very good introduction. I think what you said about cooperation is the essence here, because this is nothing we can do independently of each other, independently as nations, because there are no boundaries in the ocean. And what you do in one part will immediately affect uh, another nation and another economic soul. So that is, uh, you know, it's a, it's a big important question for many UN uh, institutions for the next decade to really address this issue. And fortunately we have some of them, FAO speaking later on today. So we will get some perspectives on this. I have a green UN t-shirt on today because tomorrow is the UN Environmental Day and on Monday is the World Ocean Day. So that's why we have Seaweed Day today. It's not institutionalized yet, but one day it will. While we are, while I am enjoying my lunch, it's <laughs> very good sushi, just bought around the corner here. Uh, I will give the word to my colleague Kjersti Ås, uh, Senior Advisor at the UN Global Compact, who have been a co-editor with you, Vincent, on this report to go through what are the key issues on this seaweed manifesto. So, this is the floor is yours. <laughs> Thank you, Eric. Enjoy your lunch. <laughs> um, so, I've been lucky to work closely with Vincent and the Lloyds Register Foundation, as well as with a truly engaged editorial board to develop this seaweed manifesto. And during this process, I've been become a huge fan of seaweed. So, I'm happy to say that today, finally, the seaweed manifesto has been launched. Uh, this is a visionary document with focus on the untapped potential of the seaweed industry and this has been a truly collaborative effort um, um, and we've had strong contribution from several organizations such as the World Bank, JEF, WWF, SIA, Ningo University in China and several others. Uh, and what all the contributors have in common is that we believe in the potential of the industry. It's important to note that the seaweed industry is already a global business. So it's currently carried out in more than 56 countries. However, more than 90% of the production is found in Asia. Uh, so although seaweed businesses are established globally, it's still an emerging industry at the start of a growth phase. So coordinated action is needed now, both to ensure that we are not missing out on opportunities but also to ensure that we are not potentially causing any unintended harm. So it's better to avoid the problems while scaling up the industry rather than fixing problems in the retrospect. So now I will take you quickly through the key parts of the manifesto, chapter by chapter. Uh, so we start with the vision. Uh, our vision is an upscaled, responsible and restorative seaweed industry playing a more significant role in achieving the global goals. Then we dive into the opportunities. So the manifesto is mentioning examples of how seaweed can contribute to a more sustainable world. And solutions for the food system is one. Seaweed can be a, a nutritional source of food for humans, and a source of food, feed for aquaculture and land animals, as well as fertilizers for crops. There are also investigations into the carbon capture and storage potential of seaweed. So this is a relatively unexplored uh, area. However, the potential for seaweed to help combat the effects of climate change could be hugely underestimated. And seaweed also provides uh, marine ecosystem support. And we also know that seaweed extracts can potentially be used as a source of packaging to replace single-use plastics. And lastly, in this post-COVID-19 context, new industries that contribute to grow, job uh, creation and economic growth are much needed. And development of this industry could help to alleviate both hunger and poverty, 
and ultimately we get more resilient coastal communities. So we'll hear more about uh, the different opportunities from uh, other speakers today. So the next chapter is about the barriers. That's factors that need, we believe uh, are slowing down the expansion of the seaweed industry. And a few of the barriers we are mentioning in the document are the following. So outside of Asia, uh, the industry is relatively fragmented. There's also a lack of aligned regulations and standards. There are still remaining technology barriers when it comes to offshore seaweed production. And some places there's a lack of spatial planning. And there is currently limited understanding within several areas, such as climate change uh, mitigation potential and market opportunities. And I think that advocacy work could help bring seaweed to people's attention. So the next chapter is then the success factors. So the Seaweed Manifesto is listing a set of success factors that needs to be in place for a responsible development of the industry. And examples of uh, such success factors are global collaboration and knowledge sharing, uh, science-based decisions, positive environmental impact, harmonized regulations, and also coordinated investments. Of course, we know that financial viability requires scale, and scale requires investment. So at the last, the manifesto, uh, this is, I mean, this is just the beginning of a journey. The manifesto is also suggesting concrete initiatives, some milestones needed for a fully and responsibly developed seaweed industry. And some of these uh, initiatives are actually already materializing. And Vincent will mention one of these initiatives, the Safe Seaweed Coalition, in his closing remarks. So I hope that this has given you an overview of the content of the manifesto and that you actually want to read it and share it. Uh, it's at, available at www.seawithmanifesto.com. I also hope that you, after this meeting, become a passionate seaweed fan uh, and that you're passionate about the potential seaweed has to address the world's most pressing challenges. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ashley. Uh, I'll stay on this screen for now before I introduce the next speaker. Um, and uh, this is not an independent exercise. This is uh, something that we think should be both collaborative, but also seen in a larger context on the work towards the uh, 17 SDGs. And that is where we are now. We are at the very beginning of the decade of action and delivery, as uh, uh, Secretary uh, Antonio Guterres has coined it. Uh, 10 years from now, we have, to, we have to really deliver on these SDGs. And two days ago, uh, the UN uh, Global Compact and the Ocean uh, Platform that we are a part of launched the Ocean Stewardship 2030 report. That is a roadmap. It's a set of 10 ambitions and recommendations on how industry and governments can deliver on the SDGs the next 10 years. And each UN General Assembly in September, every year, we will take stock and we will ask the governments and we will ask the companies, where are we and where are we heading? What are the bar barriers and what opportunities should we look for? And Seaweed will be a part of that journey and we want to like to cooperate with all of you out there for this stock taking every UN General Assembly going forward. So to introduce the next speaker, I think it's very good to have the big uh, perspectives addressed one more time or a couple more times. Why seaweed and why uh, the manifesto? So the next speaker had a discussion about the vision with Vincent uh, and really trying to put the, the big uh, global uh, understanding of the potential of, of this uh, product in all of these different uh, uh, segments. So it's my pleasure to introduce to you uh, Ms. Alexandra Cousteau. She is the CEO of Oceans 2050. Alexandra, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Eric. Um, it's wonderful to be here with everyone because um, I am tremendously excited about what Lloyd's Register and the UN Global Compact have brought together with the Seaweed Manifesto. You know, as I look back at the work that my family did for Oceans generations ago, my father was really the first one to start articulating a conservation method, um, message for the oceans back in the 60s. And that was at a time when we still had like 90% of our ocean. 
And so it was a good message to have. Um, but over the decades, we've lost half of the blue natural capital in our oceans. Half of the fish and whales and life that used to be there are now gone. And so as you know, I thought about this over the years, I realized that maybe it's time to change the language we use to articulate the path that we're taking into the future. And I realized that maybe, you know, this is provocative, but I would suggest we consider talking more about restoration of abundance, regeneration, rebuilding the lost marine biodiversity of our oceans as the, the way to articulate our ambition. And one of the um, great catalysts in my mind that will allow us to restore the, the oceans that we've lost is actually seaweed aquaculture. And the more I learn about it and the more we get involved um, with different aspects of it, the more convinced I am that seaweed aquaculture can be a game changer for the oceans. All of the ecosystem services that seaweed provides in addition to uh, livelihoods and, and jobs for people that are equitable um, all over the world. It's really, really exciting. And the work that Vincent and Eric and Kirsty have done to bring this manifesto together and articulate that vision, that broader vision of what the seaweed um, industry can accomplish if we are successful at scaling it is tremendously important. As I look at the opportunities, I also see the risks. And for me, one of the greatest risks is that as we accelerate the blue economy into the ocean um, and, and go farther and deeper than ever be, before, we will end up strip mining the oceans the way we have strip mined the land. And I think now is the time to really declare our intention for the blue economy to be restorative. When I was at um, an event about a year ago, I, I heard a lot of um, fisheries ministers and ocean ministers talking about the blue economy in terms of sustainable exploitation. And that term terrifies me. I think what we should be talking about is a blue economy that has restorative production and the ability to make the oceans better than they are today. Um, a, a scientist who's a, a extraordinary uh, thinker uh, in, in the ocean space called Carlos Duarte, who's our chief scientific advisor, recently published a paper for Nature magazine talking about rebuilding marine biodiversity and that it is possible to have the abundance in the oceans that my grandfather knew in the 1950s between now and 2050, rather than an ocean that is depleted where there's more plastic than fish. Um, the fact that that is now proven to be scientifically correct and economically beneficial means that there's one more hurdle um, that we have ahead of us, which is political engagement on that goal. But for us, I believe that it becomes a mandate to ensure that the work that we do is restorative to the ocean, as well as build strong communities um, that have more opportunities to thrive and prosper um, in a blue economy that rebuilds the oceans. Um, so I, I see the seaweed aquaculture industry as a leader in shifting that paradigm and this manifesto as setting out not just all of the different aspects of it, but a strong vision that we can all adhere to. So thank you to Vincent and Eric and Kirsty for your leadership in this space because we need to articulate this well so that people can follow and join us and I think that's what you've done. So thank you for including me in that process and it's wonderful to be here with you. Thank you so much, Alexandra, and thank you for those words. I think it's uh, very inspiring to listen to you. Production and protection must go hand in hand. Uh, we need political recognition of that, but we also need industrial recognition of that. And we have to set very high expectations to consumers, to the governance, but also the producers. And I think that's why we need an overarching manifesto as a starting point for this, so that we can get safe products, safe production, and safe environment as part of that. To continue on that, our next speaker uh, represents the World Bank, um, and uh, he's a senior specialist on aquaculture and inland fisheries in the World Bank. Mr. Ronald Brummett. Please, Ronald, the floor is yours. Thanks. 
Now, at least up until the COVID pandemic started, the world was making measurable gains against poverty. But rates remain stubbornly high in fishing communities, with many caught in a classic natural resources poverty trap where increasing poverty leads to increasing fishing and constantly decreasing fish stocks. The World Bank has estimated that there are 120 million people working in capture fisheries around the world, some 600 million fisheries dependent souls. 90%, 97% of these people live in developing countries and over 90% are small scale. 47% of the total workforce is women. A large percentage of these people are poor and under 26 years of age. The Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations estimates that 90% 90, 90 of capture fisheries, fishing stocks are in a poor state, and the World Bank has calculated that these are already overfished by 44%. There is little to no potential to generate more employment in the short term. To restore our aquatic ecosystems to health and get coastal communities permanently out of poverty, we need sustainable jobs that do not drive further declines in natural resources. Sustainable farming could be the economic engine that these seaweed farming, sorry, could be the economic engine that these people and ecosystems need. Seaweed farming uses no land or fresh water and actually cleans the marine environment where it is grown. Fish and other marine life are attracted to seaweed farms for shelter and food. While seaweed may not be the solution for all the world's ills, this is not some pie in the sky, dreamland kind of initiative. The seaweed industry exists. It already produces 30 million tons of seaweed per year. That's a quarter of global aquaculture. Half the seaweed produced in the world is eaten, but the other half is used for a wide range of industrial products and processes, with new applications being developed every day. I just learned about a project being launched to scale out a prototype seaweed-derived biodegradable food packaging material. A team at the Ecole Supérieure, Supérieure Dagro Development International in France is taking on a study of these new markets that we plan to deliver before the end of the year. A blue ribbon panel of experts convened by the World Bank calculated that if the seaweed industry can grow at a modest 14% up to 2050, we could be annually generating 50 million tons of protein, 15 million tons of high quality oils, and 1.25 billion megawatts of electricity while removing 10 million tons of nitrogen, 1 million tons of phosphorus, and capturing 135 million tons of carbon. This on just 0.03% of the ocean surface. At current production intensity, this would expanded seaweed industry would also generate some 50 million jobs in production and maybe another 50 million in the value chain. These are there are opportunities right now to rapidly increase the volume of seaweed traded in countries where trained labor and experience management can be paired to modern production and processing technology and to develop and supply new markets. Government policy is largely in place. The World Bank encourages its clients, development partners, and other investors to join with producers and processors to help us expand the seaweed industry, generate good jobs, and create real opportunities to get coastal communities on a path to prosperity. For more information, I encourage you to visit marineagronomy.org, hosted by the University of Hawaii, and download a copy of Seaweed Aquaculture for Food Security, Income Generation, and Environmental Health in Tropical Developing Countries, available on the World Bank website. Thanks, guys. Good luck. Thank you so much, Rande. And uh, extremely important points. It's a big part of the work life of millions of people, at least hundreds of thousands of people, could be for millions going forward. And one of the Q&As here addresses that. Is this a, a, is, and do the profit ends up in the, in the multinational companies or at the local uh, producers? That is something we should think about throughout these sessions. Uh, and if people have a good answer to that, please share that in your, uh, in your uh, uh, comments. Uh, I'd like to show you a few things. I've been buying a lot of seaweed uh, around here in Oslo. It's not available uh, frequently, but this is brown seaweed. It's not very popular. It's quite strong smell. And this is green. This is the grandfather of all plants on land, basically. It's very good. It's very good. It's good snacks. Uh, and to continue on the big picture, and why seaweed? And why a manifesto? Uh, we have to start with the international body of all plants and products. That is the Food and uh, Agriculture Organization of the UN. And it's uh, my pleasure to invite you, Jenny Kai. Uh, you are the Aquaculture Officer at the FAO. Please, Jenny, the floor is yours. 
Thank you, Eric. Uh, it's a great opportunity for me to uh, give a speech here and uh, to uh, participate in this exciting, important, and ambitious uh, uh, enterprise. Uh, see, we have a great potential, no doubt. But how can the potential be realized? This is the million dollar question. I don't have a crystal ball to answer it. But I would like to share with you some of my humble opinions. I have four points. They are not comprehensive, but just what I would like to highlight within the short time frame. Uh, first, let's look at the baseline situation in 2018. Uh, I would like to highlight just two points. As indicated in the table, global CV agriculture production concentrated in Asia, primarily Eastern and Southeastern Asia. As indicated in the donor chart, CV agriculture has a relatively less diversified species composition, composition compared to other uh, animal agriculture uh, uh, species. This indicates that the CV are mostly aqu aquatic commodities, yet they are major commodities with 32 million tons production accounting for 28% of the world agriculture production tonnage in 2018. That's a little bit cheating because uh, uh, FAO uh, account for the uh, wet weight of seaweed. But if you look at the value, uh, the 1.3 billion US dollar first sale value uh, accounting for 5% of uh, world agriculture production value in 2018. 5% was not trivial. It was greater than tilapia, only less than carps, shrimps, and salmon, trout, and perhaps crayfish. Anyway, so with this uh, baseline background, now let me come to my first point, which is to pay more attention to value in the short term and pursue quantity target in the long run. Well, this is just one of my conjectures. Uh, I try to be thought provoking. So if with a deeper study, I may uh, change my mind, but that's so far what I think. Many contributions of the CVs are quantity oriented, such as their contribution to food and nutrition, carbon sequestration, among others. Yet the realization of quantity potential needs to be accommodated by market expansion. Areas with high population growth and urbanization, such as Africa and Southern Asia, may have substantial market potential for CV products, such as hydrochloroids. But traditional markets for CV and CV products, such as Eastern Asia and Western Europe, have less promising and ne or negative uh, population growth. Low CV consumption in many places in the world implies market expansion potential, but forming or changing dietary habits tends to be a long-term process, even with the increasing popularity of uh, health food. Niche or value-added products, such as uh, CV vegetables, biofertilizers, and so on, may not generally uh, as much uh, quantity as uh, uh, commodity seaweeds in the short run, but they, their substantial uh, economic value could help foster a robust seaweed industry waiting for a market leap forward due to technology or market breakthroughs. Now it's my second point. It's about value chain. Seaweed farming may be jump-started by different impetuses but it needs a strong value chain to become sustainable. This is particularly important for project-driven CV development. A healthy, strong value chain needs to be of low transaction costs, less asymmetric information and effective resharing mechanisms. Public interventions are needed to help strengthening a CV value chain. For example, the public sector can help identify and foster potential key or core value chain players based on experience in CV value development elsewhere. However, the public sector should be careful not to overly intervene in the value chain development. For example, uh, arbitrarily shortening the value chain for the reason of blaming the intermediaries or extending the value chain, for example, restriction over raw CV materials export in order to promote local processing industry. My third point is about good governance. If anything, we can learn from the experiences of a global agriculture development. High social and environmental 
standards should be enforced efficiently and effectively at the very beginning. It is a good habit to be uh, formed from the very beginning. Governance is not only about law and regulations. Institutions such as the farmers groups and community-based management can also become equally or more effective governing mechanisms. My last point is about data information. There's much room for improvement in data and information for every stage of a CV value chain. As the provider of the only agriculture, uh, global agriculture production database, FAO would like to work with partners to improve the quantity and quality of CV data and statistics for evidence-based policymaking and sector management. With enough data inf and information, we may eventually have a crystal ball that can not only help see through the future, but also shape it. I would like to end my speech with a quote from an FAO publication on the social and economic dimensions of a Carrigenan CV farming. I quote, not only must CV farming offer a comparable, even higher incomes for the same effort and risk as alternative activities, but it must conform to institutional and social structures, other coastal users, government officials, community leaders, banks, donors, NGOs, and Kerguelen processes, as well as, as well as potential farmers, must have their legitimate wants satisfied. Technical feasibility is not sufficient if farmers lack incentives, governance penalize entrepreneurship, or social structures preclude development. With this note, I would like to express my appreciation for having this floor, and many thanks for your attention. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jan and Kai, and thank you to all your colleagues. You have been contributing a lot to this manifesto and we really look forward to working together going forward as well. And I think you raised a very important point in the end there that we need science-based and knowledge-based input to these policies and investment dec decisions. We are also at the beginning of the decade of ocean science, uh, and this should be a very integral integral part of that decade that we get more knowledge about this potential of seaweed but also we need more information about the social dimensions not only the water and climate effects we need to understand the economic and social consequences of building an industry or addressing this industry and that is a good segue to the next segment because now we're going to talk to some of the sector-based experts here, or get some perspective and visions from select areas. Uh, we're gonna start with food, then we're gonna have carbon capture and storage, and then we're gonna have ecosystem services. And to start with the food chain, and, and food is, is, the, is maybe what we think about immediately. We have shown some food here. And later on today, I'm gonna make some spaghetti, seaweed spaghetti for uh, dinner to my kids. I don't know if they're gonna be happy, I don't know if I'm going to be happy, but we're going to try. Looking forward to it. But first out, to talk about seaweed and the food chain, is the director of corporate responsibility in Metro, a wholesale uh, company for the food industry, both uh, retail and, uh, and industry. Uh, Ms. Andrea Weber, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Eric. And actually, your seaweed spaghetti are the perfect bridge to my talk, as I will come back to that later. First of all, thank you for inviting me and I'm really proud to be here at the, and can speak at the launch of the Seaweed Manifesto today. Um, giving you a short overview on Metro. Um, Metro in its wholesale business is active in 24 countries with 678 stores in the wholesale business and an additional 10 stores in delivery. We at Metro are passionate about food. And so are our customers. Our customers in Metro are hotels, restaurants, the catering industries. These professionals make their living with our products. They take very informed buying decisions and they know exactly what they want. We at Metro want to offer them an assortment that differentiates us from our competitors. As Metro, um, Animal and plant proteins, of course, are a crucial offer. Next slide, please. For example, in fish and seafood, we are selling 200,000 tons of fish and seafood per year 
Fish is one of our USPs worldwide and our global turnover is roughly 1.3 billion euro per year. In order to fulfill the protein needs of future generations and enabling our, our customers to differentiate themselves, Metro recently put a strategic focus on conscious proteins. We want to contribute to the innovation and transformation in their use and contribute to a conscious consumption. When we define conscious proteins, we talk about animal proteins, plant proteins, and alternative proteins. And seaweed, of course, classified as alternative protein here. Our country portfolio, as you've seen, is very diverse. In Europe, seaweed is not a large category for us, despite some of the Asian clients we have. However, in some Asian countries, it is a key ingredient of the daily diet. Next slide, please. Look at that shelf. You can see that in our Japanese stores. We serve more than 140 different kinds of sea vegetables, how we call them, to our customers. Uh, that, uh, yeah. Also in Western and in Eastern Europe, we can see an increasing demand for healthy products and alternative pro proteins. Ocean vegetables have getting a lot of um, attention as superfood, not only because they are low in calories and fat, but also they are rich in vitamins, minerals, and fiber. But it is still a niche in Europe, in consumption in Europe. Let me give you an example, and this comes back to Eric, the seaweed spaghetti you just showed. We have our food innovation hub, Annex Food, and we open our shop floor to um, novel and innovative foods. We have startup shelves in our stores in Germany, Netherlands, and Austria. And we recently offered pasta and wraps made from seaweed. This is one way we try to integrate seaweed into something familiar to customers. But the success actually was low. Why? Our customers perceived the products as tasting fishy. And knowing what our, motivates our customers to buy is of course crucial. And although health and sustainability arguments are becoming more important, taste still comes first. So I think there is a way to go. In addition, meeting our food safety standards in Metro, which are very high, and having a stable supply chain is still a challenge for seaweed. We source for human consumption today, and that also includes Japan, where seaweed is well known. But we also continue to explore how we can integrate this food source more into our assortment. One way we see that is animal feed. Although it is an, at an early stage, we are investigating alternatives in aquaculture and meat to replace common feed as example for soy. To conclude, I definitely believe that sea will, wheat will play a more important role in the future. And we at Metro are happy to be part of this journey. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Andrea. Thank you so much. And again, to all of you attendees, we are about 400 people here in this session. This is Seaweed Day and the launch of the Seaweed Manifesto. I've got some Q&As about where to find the documents and so on. The main document is available both at the Young Global Compact website, the Nodes Register Foundation website, and also at the, uh, the, uh, the dedicated seaweedmanifesto.com. You can download it there. Uh, and as uh, Andrea said, it's on the rise in Europe, but maybe too slowly. But my kids, they're eating more and more of this. It's super good. It's good snacks. But to really get the idea on the, how this can be a really integrated part of our consumption as humans, uh, we will have the next speaker also talk about food chains. And that is from Japan. And uh, then our next speaker is manager of bioresources and business development division at Raiken Food in Japan. Uh, your Chisato, please, the floor is yours. Hello, thank you for Eric. I'm really happy to talk today on the fantastic Congress of Seaweed. Our Raiken Food is a food company of seaweed. We research, develop, and produce the seaweed food for retail and uh, a business products. 
So as you know well, Japan is one of the mature market area of seaweed in the world because we have used seaweed since ancient period, especially for food. So it's not too much to say that seaweed is a backbone of Japanese food. So today I'd like to share information of the food value chains of seaweed. So I focus to three points to being added value of seaweed in Japan, cultivation, processing, and the interest for health. So the first, developing of cultivation method. We use about 100 species of seaweed as food. Now among them, and nori, this one, and the wakame. Wakame, you can see top page of the manifesto, and the kombu, this one, it's uh, for soup stock of Japanese food. Now, these are three major species in Japan, and these are mostly produced by cultivation. The cultivation has a lot of benefits. For fishery producers, it's contributed to get a relatively stable yield and income. And for companies, it's contributed to get a stable quality. A stable and higher quality bring a safe food to consumers. And second, developing a processing method. In Japan, we have a lot of processing methods of seaweed suitable for each species. For example, boiling and salt, drying and freezing. And uh, especially, it's uh, our retail, drying wakame. It's a so pieces of drying wakame. So only put into the water or hot water after this one, waiting uh, one or two minutes. You can eat it for salada, for miso soup, and uh, for uh, wakame tapas with vinegar. Um, it's a uh, very easy to use. And other benefits, these drying wakame can be stored for a long period and its transportation costs can be reduced. And the third, um, growing interest for health of seaweed in Japan. So in Japan, seaweed is regarded as a traditional food. However, now all generation, including the young people, positively consume it. Because um, a lot of people understand seaweed is healthy food with low calorie, including uh, so much minerals, vitamins, and polysaccharides. Now, actually, by the research data, average intake rate of seaweed is growing higher than vegetables and cereals in Japan today. For seaweed companies like us, it's important to advertise with more emphasis on the health benefits of seaweed. I talked about the three, three value chains of seaweed in Japan. So Japanese market of seaweed is really now very active. However, we face a crisis of raw material now by the climate changes and the decreasing the number of fisheries, uh, fishery producers. So today the um, yields cannot satisfy the domestic market, uh, domestic demand in Japan. Therefore, I think all stages about seaweed from um, cultivation to the market from fishery producers to customers, and from basic scientists to the industrial applications, all fields need to collaborate. So I hope to progress activities of this sea, uh, safe seaweed production by this seaweed manifesto. During my talking, it's so rehydration the wakame, drain wakame, Ooh. and uh, I will eat it. Thanks so much. Wow, thank you so much. That was a transformation, you know. Excellent. I think I have almost the same thing here. And this is what Shashte tasted in the beginning. And she's not in the picture anymore, as you see. She's sitting down. <laughs> it's a bit about a culture experience here, but I think the health effect is significant. This is, this is pure produce. You don't have to really process it that much. And as you say, you can store it for a long time. Very important things for us all to learn from you, uh, Yoichi uh, Sato. And I think it's, it's a journey for uh, non-Asian countries to see how we can uh, 
how do these produce as, as a part of our consumption. Now, moving to the next speaker, this is more like carbon capture and storage to me. This looks like a lot of carbon and maybe it should be stored in this glass as well. Uh, and this is a field I find very interesting because the carbon market is already up and running, but we haven't really looked at seaweed uh, to be produced and cultivated for CCS. So I'm really glad to have one of the leading European scientific institutions that works with companies to develop new standards and solutions uh, to discuss this with us. And we have a senior scientist, Jürgen Sharmo, who will uh, share some very interesting insights with you all and take part in this discussion. There's a big discussion going online in the Q&A. I hope everybody sees it. We are taking down all the questions and notes to further discussions, but please, Jürgen, the floor is yours. Thank you, Eric, and uh, thank you for this invitation and uh, congratulations with the Seaweed Manifesto. Uh, could I have the first uh, slide or my only slide? Thank you. So, uh, macroalgae, like for instance uh, the big brown sugar cubs, they grow really fast and produce uh, large biomass. And uh, this biomass yield in the seaweed production can compete with uh, that for most crops, land-based crops, and, uh, and also when cultivating in the cold ocean areas far to the north, like in Norway. So, uh, so this is a very exciting biomass for, uh, for capturing uh, carbon dioxide. Uh, we have very good um, areas for cultivating seaweeds up in, uh, in Norway at the Norwegian coast. And uh, these pictures that you see now, they illustrate the biomass production per square kilometer at the coast outside central Norway. And uh, they also show that uh, by going offshore further from the coast, you can have an even better growth and biomass production. And thus, you will also have a higher carbon dioxide uptake per area unit. And for instance, uh, cultivating kelp at sea areas corresponding to 20,000 square kilometers would take up at least 50, 000, uh, 50 million tons of, of CO2. And uh, the reason mentioning this 50, in 50 million tons of CO2 is uh, that this is the amount of CO2 that is released from uh, Norway every year. But we don't have to only talk about Norway. This is more like a, a case. Uh, but depending on the use of the biomass. So the seaweed cultivation may have a neutral or an even positive impact on the climate in three ways. <clears throat> and uh, this is either by uh, replacing fossil products like fuel or plastics, or we can also replace uh, land-based biomasses uh, with a heavier climate footprint, like for instance, soy protein. Or the third um, way is, uh, to do storage of the biomass in a way that prevents the CO2 uh, is released for several hundred of years. For instance, by sinking the biomass for deposition in deep seafloor valleys, as you can see at the, the picture to the, to the right here. Uh, and this should be at the more than 1,000 meter depth. So here the biomass will probably be gradually digested, but no carbon like methane or CO2 will enter the atmosphere again from these steps due to the high pressure. So in this way, we can buy time. And it might be that this concept for carbon capture and storage it's, uh, is not the ultimate solution, but one alternative that can be con contribute to reduce the greenhouse gas concentration. And it's urgent to start CO2 sequestration. We all know that. So uh, this concept should be looked further into now. We should also remember that the uh, shredding of tissue of all types of wild or cultivated macroalgae, this happens all the time, naturally. <clears throat> and uh, this material is transported over lo <clears throat> long distances, sorry, <clears throat> for, ending, for ending up on the bottom of the ocean. So in fact, these natural processes account for a significant transportation of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere via the seaweed forests to the bottom sediments. So by seaweed cultivation and deposition of the biomass at deep sea floor, we can do this process actively and in a really large scale. In fact, as large as we, as we want. So this will of course uh, require access to large sea areas for cultivation. 
but uh, at least as as we have seen in our studies, um, we, we know that the ocean areas offshore gives an even higher production and the CO2 removal than in their more occupied areas where we have a lot of uh, transportation or fisheries or other things going on. So there should be areas enough for this, both in the upper productive areas and at the deep bottom floor. We have knowledge about the production potentials and thus the CO2 binding in the seaweed biomass. And we have also started to look into seaweed farming in exposed open sea locations now. And by cultivating biomass for carbon dioxide capture and removal, this is uh, controversial. And uh, we also need to discuss whether it is ethical right to use ocean resources, like the dissolved nutrients in the ocean, and use this for carbon storage. So what is the potential possible impact on uh, the primary production in the oceans by doing this? This is also things that we need to know. But if we want to exploit this opportunity for carbon removal, we need to start now with developing both the technological and economical solutions for it. So to uh, end my uh, speak here, uh, I will have three questions and they are, how can we do it? What is the price and who's going to pay for it? Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Jürgen. Extremely, extremely interesting. It's a dawn of a new industry, if we get it right. Uh, 50 million square meters, uh, 50 million tons of CO2 can be taken out. And this seaweed grows that large in six months. So it's quite interesting compared to land-based forestry to capture carbon. Uh, but it's also a good segue to our next speaker addressing ecosystem services. As you said, Jorun, this is happening all the time naturally, but there are 10,000 types of kelp or seaweed throughout the world. And you can't really introduce these specimens uh, on various sites all over the world. It has to be a local type, of course, but there is already a big destruction going on on kelp and seaweed that needs to be uh, replaced and, and built up again. And we need to have an awareness and a knowledge about this, this balance in the sea before do, we're doing anything. Nobody wants this manifesto to be the start of a nightmare journey where we wake up 10 years from now and the sea is just green over the whole globe and there's one type of seaweed taking over everything. Maybe we don't have any CO2 anymore, but we have too much seaweed. I don't know. This is for scientists to address. And I think Tiffany Waters, aquaculture strategy specialist at the Nature Conservancy, you will talk a bit about <clears throat> ecosystem services. So please, Tiffany, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Eric. I appreciate it. So um, yes, my name is Tiffany Waters, and I work at the Nature Conservancy. I'm actually based out of our Washington, D.C. headquarters at home today. But I'm from a very small coastal community in the Pacific Northwest of the U.S., where I grew up very dependent on our marine resources, just like so many people are globally. So many of us rely on our marine waters, our habitats, and our species for our health, our culture, our economy, and connection. And however, as Alexandra talked about, globally we've lost many of our marine habitats. We've lost 85% of our oyster reefs, many of our seaweed forests, and with the losses of these keystone species, we've lost the ecological and ecosystem services they provide. However, there is existing evidence that seaweed and shellfish aquaculture can help provide some of those lost environmental benefits. So I'm excited today to speak about seaweed aquaculture. It's really important to me, and it's a cornerstone of TNC aquaculture program. We actually work in some countries to conduct research on and that's what we call restorative aquaculture when seaweed and shellfish aquaculture provide ecological benefits to the surrounding environment while also providing food and jobs. And when we consider that traditional restoration projects are expensive and sometimes impractical or unsupported in many parts of the world, leveraging commercial seaweed aquaculture to improve the environment is a massive opportunity where we can unlock the power of the market for conservation gains. And the opportunity for restorative aquaculture is truly global. The recent analysis that shows that all inhabited countries on Earth have the potential to conduct seaweed aquaculture to provide livelihood opportunities while creating conservation gains. But most geographies are coming up short on this opportunity 
Many countries are at an early or even non-existent state of seaweed production, and others are producing at scale. But often um, there's been growing interest in the benefits that seaweed can provide, and we and partners have been conducting global state of the science and in the water work on shellfish and seaweed aquaculture. On the ground, an example of the work that our team has been conducting over the last few years is actually in Belize on the habitat provisions of farmed Bikini isoform. We're finding that when farmed inside a well, seaweed aquaculture is providing habitat for and can provide habitat for locally important commercial species like lobster and conch, as well as provide an alternative livelihood for fishers as part of the fisheries reform effort we've been working on with the government. Beyond the benefits, though, challenges that facing the seaweed industry also include unsustainable farming practices that are from many parts of the world, which can cause significant damage to sensitive habitats. When farmed unsustainably, seaweed can compete for space in near shore areas and damage coral reefs, mangroves, and seagrasses, which are also all essential habitats. Um, we and other organizations, though, are working with farming communities in places like Indonesia to engage in better management practices for the better environment and the local livelihoods, as well as encourage continued conservation of marine protected areas. Now, despite the challenges, there is a significant amount of opportunity that seaweed aquaculture can provide to both people and nature if we get to maximize and influence the delivery of ecosystem services. Some of the research that we still need to um, um, you know, engage in includes one quantifying and economically valuing ecosystem services by type, such as water quality, habitat, climate, and two, improving our understanding of the factors that influence delivery, such as siting and farm design and species type, farm management practices. And beyond research, we need to continue to conduct trainings and create better management practices for farmers. We need to strengthen supply chains, as, as others have talked about and encourage innovation in farm design and new product lines by addressing challenges, maximizing environmental benefits, and creating new value chains. This will be really key to helping seaweed aquaculture meet its potential and create climate resilient livelihoods. And the Seaweed Manifesto is, is such an important vision and its focus on science-based solutions and collaboration is a really big step forward in helping us all work together to create a truly restorative seaweed aquaculture industry and meet our sustainable development goals. So thank you so much to Lloyd's um, Register, to the UN Global Compact for, um, for creating this and for inviting us today. So thanks so much. Thank you so much, uh, Tiffany. Uh, I think that was a very holistic approach to the whole issue. Uh, and some of you have probably seen the blue papers coming out from the high level panel on sustainable blue economy. Uh, commissioned over the last year and uh, uh, being building up to the next UN Ocean Conference next year. Uh, one of the papers addresses um, the integrated ocean management. You have to understand the part of ocean and land, the relationship between ocean and land, where you have runoffs and waste from land entering the sea, but where seaweed might be actually be a part of the solution on restoring the habitat, the coastal habitats and that we have to take into account not only ocean activities, but also land activities when it comes to ocean health and uh, ocean production. Very interesting papers coming out there. We are also seeing some of these uh, discussions through the uh, WRI and World Economic Forum interactive dialogues meetings throughout this week. And one issue reoccurring, and uh, Jorun was uh, pointing that uh, specifically out, is how, do we, how are we going to pay for all of this? How do we internalize this into our economy. And um, before I give the floor to the next speaker, I just would like to remind everybody that we, uh, a month ago, launched the Blue Bond reference paper. That's the brother of the green bonds. But the blue bonds is really trying to encapsulate how can we uh, take the blue dimensions into the economy so that companies can issue a bond by internalizing their ambitions on delivering on sustainable ocean business as such. And that's beyond climate issues. It could be on uh, f food uh, production. It can be on using less antibiotics. It can be on uh, sustainable work uh, conditions and so forth. These instruments are very important because when we talk to banks and, and especially funds, big pension funds, they want to invest their money in sustainable stuff but they don't know what that is. They need a roadmap and they need a principled approach. And that is why we produced the Blue Bond paper. 
And that's why we work with all of you guys to really set the expectations right on what is sustainable and what's not. And then you can make a profit. So on the, those words, it's great to invite uh, the next speaker from BNB Paribas. He's a strategic advisor on sustainable business. Pierre Rousseau, known by many here, and it's great to have you here today. Pierre, please. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Eric. And um, yeah, I'm the one in Lisbon, so just for uh, t taking the fort here um, alone. Um, just to tell you that uh, this is very important what we listen here. Uh, we had scientists, we had uh, technology, we had business, we had uh, supranational people here representing civil society. So I think we just had finance and then we can do the business of tomorrow. So this is the component today to make the finance and, and to make the economic business. And uh, I think all of us here together is probably the first time or one of the first time when we gather all those people together to launch something. And uh, finance is pretty pleased to be here and the bank and BNP Paribas especially as we are, uh, we write a paper on the, on the blue economy and uh, we do believe this is the part of the future. As you probably know, a lot of banks are giving up on a certain number of traditional business. And uh, for instance, we have given up on tobacco, but it means that uh, we have also to find new, uh, new opportunity of business and we have to go for new businesses. And what is different here in this new business is first we start by statement of conservation on climate change, on inclusion. I think we have insisted probably on inclusion, which is very part. The, the equality of the supply chain need to be preserved. And I think this is where we would like to start. The starting point is about this one. And then it's about to build business around that. And the success of a business here, if we look at a business, because you have to keep at the end, when we have to talk to investor, we have to talk their language. We need to explain them in risk return. We have to explain them what we will talk about. And his, the best risk return here is the conservation that we will take as a base. And to start with that here, in terms of risk, what we're talking about here, we're talking about a business without deforestation, a business without fertilizer, a chemical fertilizer, a business without a business without a problem of water. It's all businesses that where we are struggling for the time being to get out on the land. So this is suppressing all the barriers that we have to start with when normally we are dealing with the business on the land that we need to take care of. And so we talk here about country uh, in developing market where there is already a big growth, but we talk also about country in, in developed market. And we see the potential we do have here to develop activities in developed market, which to, you don't find so many business around that today. And we talk about, uh, and we had a, a, a very good discussion about carbon sequestration and the way to monetize carbon sequestration. So this is all element which is adding up on the monetization of the way we can find the solution. And I want to say also that it's not only about food, we're talking about uh, biomedical, we're talking about medicines care, medical care, we talk about textile, we talk about plastic packaging, we talk about a lot of things that we don't even know today. So the technology part of it, which is also important part on the way that we want to develop. So we're talking about offtake, we're talking about venture capital, we're talking about uh, financing uh, product. So it's all different toolbox that we have. So the way we will have to finance this type of business is by creating hybrid solution, public private solution, blended finance type of solution, mixing private equity, mixing, mixing uh, private debt, mixing probably off taking at one stage by the big financial companies or the big financial investors who could off take when the business is mature. So we will have business which is uh, what we call um, off take, off taking, generating beginning at the beginning of the, the activities, but we will have also mature business very quickly. And so that's why we will have to create tools, which are not the tools that exist today, but which are probably built up with the, with the, uh, with the toolbox that we do have in finance. This will come to what we call in BNP Paribas collective, collective financing, because to make it happen, we will have to put together not only the business people, not only the investor, but also the scientists, also the people who understand 
the, the, the people who understand the farming, who do the training of the farmers that we explained just before. So we need to put all this together on structure. And today, those kind of solutions are starting to come out. It's called blended finance. And so I do believe we will have the tools in order to create by putting all the collective group that we have here in order to finance. And don't forget about the way we can probably leverage the sequestration of carbon. Yep. So at the end, we talk about high impact. This is what people are looking at. We're talking about high uh, risk return model. So this is something that normally I do believe a lot of investors will probably be quite happy to hear about. Thank you, Pierre. That was very well said because you made a red thread through all the uh, speakers' uh, comments today. And it's about taking that vision and uh, really make it into reality by uh, understanding the risk and putting a price on it. And, and we need everybody to work on that. So we have a blended finance system or are able to create a market force for this. The last two speakers will first give us the roadmap for the way forward. That will be you, Vincent. And then we will have the final reflections on the meetings from Stuart Hendricks and our special advisor, Ocean, for the UN Global Compact. So first, Vincent, what happens now? Where are we? Well, first, it's amazing to see that all coming together from uh, so many different countries, different people, different organizations with different objectives working together. It has been an incredible journey here. Uh, this is just the beginning, actually. Uh, I do believe so. Uh, there was so much said that today on CBID and so much still to be mentioned. Uh, most of the applications are still to be discovered. I would like to thank once again all the speakers here uh, and the entire editorial board as well who built this manifesto because uh, they have been all great and we were not able to accommodate all of them. So I would like to mention WWF, Association Biologique de Roscoff, Ningbo University from China, Seaweed Industry Association from the Philippines, Cargill, SAMS, SEA, SEMAC, and the World Resource Institute. They are all listed in the manifestos that have been really great. And they are, we are all CBD Manifesto ambassadors, you know, and we should support it. So I would like to call everyone to support us online on the website. This website could become a place for a global CBD community. Our contact details are in. We will be glad to answer any question and to share news, blogs very soon and so forth. This manifesto is not about intention only. It's not just about nice words. It's about taking action. So we as Lloyd Register, along with all our partners here and, and all, all the CBIT stakeholders are willing to take a first action, which is to create a global uh, uh, coalition for safe seaweed production. Mm -hmm. um, and as we've seen today, with the exception of Asia, seaweed industry is very limited, totally disconnected and highly fragmented. The handful of very brave pioneers who work in isolation, starting from scratch and being supported only by very local mechanisms. We should enable global cooperation to scale up that industry. Industry pioneers, experienced businesses, investors, IGOs, NGOs, and academics need to enforce global standards of safety, environmental safety, and occupational safety. Why safety? Because safety is a non-competitive topic agnostic to any application, and as such, has a strong potential for convening people together and initiate collaboration. We expect building this global coalition will have an impact on scaling up the business, but this won't be enough. We need to better understanding, we need to better understand sorry, the market mechanism, we need to move forward on offshore production, we need to accelerate research on genetics, we need to develop a verifiable blue carbon economy in agreement with UNFCCC, we need to industrialize production and manufacturing processes, we need global advocacy for ocean restoration and to support customer education for more responsible purchases. So we do hope this manifesto release marks the beginning of a new journey to scale up the use of seaweed all around this blue planet. And all together, like the same ocean, we need to make this blue revolution a bit greener than it is today. Mm -hmm. Thank you, and I leave the floor to Sturla for the closing remark. Yes, Sturla, the floor is yours while I eat. No, I think that this has really been an informative, interesting, and very inspiring session. And I think that, Eric, your curious first time tasting of seaweed snacks is pretty illustrative of the topic at hand. Because I would suspect that before starting today, several in the audience may have found seaweed to be a fairly 
exotic and marginal topic in the grand scheme of things. And admittedly, uh, so did I, before deep diving into this subject quite some time ago. A scuba diver uh, instructor in my spare time, I for many years used to just swim across the large fields of seaweed, uh, viewing them basically as a nice part of the underwater scenery a mere backdrop to the much more vibrant and colorful marine life and the exciting uh, experiences uh, of the Big Blue. But upon learning more, I've come to understand their crucially important ecosystem services and the fascinating opportunities that they are offering going forward, as we've heard from our excellent uh, presenters uh, today. For developing products for food, feed, fuel, clothes, packaging, cosmetics, and medical appliances. For mitigating climate change, reducing ocean acidification, improving coastal protection, and for developing new livelihoods and profitable industries. And you have mentioned it several times, Eric, that we have just entered the decade of deliveries on the 17 Sustainable Development Goals. And now we need to tap the potential and to translate these promising opportunities into practical actions, scalable solutions, and commercial investments. And this is an undertaking requiring a comprehensive, holistic approach across regulatory, industrial, and scientific boundaries, which is pretty much mirroring the boundary-free ocean space as it's outlined in the Seaweed Manifesto launched uh, today. We need to improve knowledge and expertise. We need to develop new financial instruments like the Blue Bonds hybrid and blended finance solutions. And we need, I think, to help policymakers and consumers make informed choices. And I think this is also an undertaking truly emblematic of the dual challenges that we are facing in improving ocean health while concurrently increasing ocean production. In the seaweed industry, there will be no viable business opportunities without a healthy, clean and productive ocean. And conversely, a viable seaweed industry can help restore and rebuild the healthy, clean and production, uh, productive ocean that we need. And I think that Alexandra captured the very essence of this by the term restorative production. So in short, seaweed production, I find it a very compelling concept. It offers a double set of solutions to the dual challenges that we are facing. And that I think is really food, if not seaweed snacks for thought. So good luck and thank you. Thank you so much, Surla. Thank you for everybody taking part. Check out seaweedmanifesto.com. Sign up, join us in this great journey. Have a snack, everybody. Great seeing you here. And thank you so much for taking part.